Maybe you've already seen the announcement that was posted, uh, but your class, your midterm grades have been uh, released. They should be available to you uh, on Gradecope. Um, so we will be using Gradecope for uh, regrades and such things. And uh, um, so I, you know, I've been teaching this class for about a decade, and every year the same thing happens. The midterm uh, grads and undergrads do basically uh, indistinguishably in the midterm. Um, you can take a look at your grades and you can figure out where you stand with respect to this. Uh, if you get something like in the uh, uh, around 70, I would consider that a good score. Um, uh, remember that eventually we'll be uh, adding up all the scores across the midterms and the homeworks and all those things, but weighted according to the scheme that uh, um, I described in the very first lecture. And uh, that is the score that will be curved, where grads and undergrads will be treated as different. Um, so, you know, it, this has no bearing directly on your data grade. That's one point. The second point is that, well, it has a bearing, but it's not the only thing. The second point is uh, some students look at this number and get very stressed. Not this number, but the number that you get. Um, and you might get stressed, but I want to remind you that uh, each exam co costs only 10% of the total grade. Um, it's the homeworks that really matter and the projects. Uh, any questions about this? Ah, yes. So uh, there's a question. Are the overall grades in Canvas a good indication uh, of the total for the class at this point? Not quite. I think uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to my TA to remind me. We'll uh, set this up so that the weighted averages are set up on Canvas. Uh, at that point, it'll be an, uh, a good reflection. But... Uh, um, once again, I just want to remind you that uh, you know some students get very stressed looking at their midterm scores. I want to point out that the midterm was not meant to be easy. Uh, maybe some of you might disagree, but uh, it was not meant to be easy. So don't worry about that. And also, it's uh, relative performance that matters, and it's all ten percent of the total grade. Uh, we'll find out. Um, we'll find out. <laughs> it's an adventure for all of us. <laughs> Uh, any questions about any of this? You should have received something. I think there's a message on Piazza uh, talking about this. Uh, speaking of homeworks and such things and projects, uh, there is a homework five that was posted on Canvas. Is it due Monday? No, it's not due uh, Friday. It's due next Monday. No, ignore it. whatever that day is. Um, homework 5 is due. Uh, it was posted on Monday. You get a week for it. And uh, this is entirely on Canvas. It's a quiz where you get two attempts. Uh, it covers boosting and ensemble. It basically steps you through the Adaboost algorithm, uh, has you construct uh, a three-week classifiers and combine them by following the steps. And then you have to make predictions using the week classifier, the, the, the ensemble uh, classifier that you build. Um, this homework is not really difficult. It should not take too much time. It is just following the mechanics of the whole thing. So it should be rather quick. Um, when I say rather quick, I mean, unlike your previous homework, maybe which maybe took a few days. At least one person told me that homework five took several days. This one is a matter of several hours, uh, which is why we're giving you a week for it. Um, just to kind of uh, give, give you a sense of things to come after this. On Tuesday next week, you have uh, you, the last homework will be released. Uh, that is a uh, homework where you'll be implementing, deriving and implementing uh, the stochastic gradient descent for logistic regression. Hopefully by then, you'll have covered enough of this material that uh, this will not be terrible. Um, it, uh, it, it's also uh, it's a programming heavy homework. So I encourage you to kind of make time for that. Um, on April 4th, that's Monday, there will be two more uh, submissions that are due uh, on Kaggle and a short report on Canvas. Once again, this is just a progress report. Sort of thing. Just let me know where things are, uh, how things are going. Uh, there were some questions on, yes. Um, in regards to the exam, are we going to get paper copies back? No, you, it's on grade school. On grade school. Yeah, yeah you, you won't get paper copies back because they have been 
uh, scanned and they have been cut in a certain way that makes it a little painful to disentangle. If you've been a TA, you know what I'm talking about. If not, it's painful. But it's uh, all on uh, the digital version is available. So any questions about the project? There was some discussion on, I think, uh, Piazza about um, how do we how do we get to uh, um, six submissions at the end of the semester? So I just want to kind of list out all the algorithms that we've seen and how you can put together six submissions quite easily. So we've seen decision trees, we've seen perceptron, we are in the middle of SVM, and we will be uh, looking at logistic regression. Between all of those, you have four options. Uh, yes. So the like six submissions have to be like different algorithms to count as different submissions, or if you just like I did three on a similar list and set and submit that, and then decided to like pre-process all the data and then you have to do again, would that count as a separate submission or would that? Good question. So that's the so there are four algorithms that we've seen so far, and let me list out all the algorithms and then talk about the craft product. So it's probably at this point, it's worth writing the things down. So you have uh, decision tree, there's the perceptron, uh, SVM, <laughs> logistic regression, I'm just calling it LR. And then we've covered ensembles. So you, you can take each of these and you can uh, create a boosted decision tree, you can create a boosted perceptron, whatever. You could also do things like, so plus, Ensemble. A boosted, uh, an ensemble of decision trees is different from an ensemble of, say, um, um, uh, SVMs. So you have, you can mix and match ensembles and get all sorts of different uh, classifiers. Another uh, axis to consider is features. So you have a uh, uh, glove, um, PFIDF, uh, did bag of words. And then there is uh, missed. So the rules say that you have to have at least four different algorithms. So you have one, two, three, four, plus if you include ensembles, that's like you're basically doubling the capacity here. You have eight algorithms at your disposal. You need to pick at least four. You need to choose at least two different features, use at least two different feature sets. So to answer your question, um, if you use MISC and train an IV3, and then you pre-process the data to use some other features and train ID3, those can count as separate submissions. Um, and you know, this mixing and matching across these, you can, for instance, I'm just making up an example here. You can apply decision trees to MISC, perceptron, and SVM. So that's one. Perceptron to TFIDS is one, maybe perceptron to bag of words is one, SVM to glove is one. SVM to uh, say bag of words is one that gives you five, and maybe logistic regression applied to bag of words that's six. So you covered four algorithms, three. Uh, in this case, you actually have three features, but uh, uh, you, you can do uh, fewer than that. Or you can mix and match in interesting ways. Okay. Um, doesn't mean that you should do only these. Feel free to do the cross product of everything against everything. Uh, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some compute, but you, know, you're, uh, you can do what you want. Uh, there are a few questions in uh, Zoom, so I'll answer those one at a time. Um, decision trees and decisions, uh, ensemble of decision terms count as different algorithms. They do. Uh, can we use models that we did not talk about in class yet, like logistic? Regression, uh, neural networks. We will talk about logistic regression and neural networks in a bit, but uh, um, you can use them, of course. Uh, we, you won't be, due to time constraints, you will not be implementing uh, neural networks in a homework, um, but if you can implement them, that's fine. In fact, there's another uh, possibility that I've not mentioned here. You can use an external library for at most one submission. So if you want to use neural networks uh, from PyTorch uh, or some such library, Feel free to do that uh, with one of these features that can be at most one submission. Um, with all this combined, we have 32 different combinations. Um, I can see there are 32, but this actually, uh, I've not talked about this, but you can actually do a little bit more because you can have 
uh, boosted decision trees, you can have bagging with decision trees, you can have random forest with decision trees, and they're all different. Uh, so it's just a combination of things. Um, de decision tree plus miscellaneous and decision tree plus glove are different algorithms. Other questions? Yes. Uh, no, you should use at least two of these in any form. Um, I'm not saying two feature sets, but two data sets. Or two, two of these given data sets. If it puts about six of those. And combine them, yeah, sure. That, those are fine. That counts as you've used to. Yes. I'm not counting those as different algorithms. Yes. And don't see any specific on the code submission. On the code submission? Yeah. You will be submitting your code for the final with the final report. Um, so the final report will require uh, uh, a, a final report plus the code just like you submitted for your report. Other questions? If there are no other questions, we're going to go back into uh, support vector machines. In the last lecture, we were looking at um, support vector machines. And uh, oh, so the question is it's code only for six submissions? That's right. Uh, only for the six, one, six submissions that you would like us to grade. Uh, you can, you need to mark, you need to tell us which submissions on uh, Kaggle are the ones that are uh, to be graded. And you can, uh, I think Kaggle assigns an ID for every submission. So you can just tell us which IDs are the ones that uh, are official. So in the last lecture, we were looking at support vector machine. And uh, we saw that there was the, the, the goal of learning support vector machine can be essentially converted into an optimization problem. In particular, it's the problem of uh, uh, given that we have a weight vector W that we would like to learn, which is in RD. The learning problem is simply minimize, try to solve the following minimization problem over all possible values of W, meaning explore every possible uh, weight vector and try to find the one that minimizes the following function, half W transpose W plus C sum over X, Y in your data, the things lost. I'm just writing where the things lost is simply max of zero comma one minus Y W transpose X. And what we saw was, uh, you know, we spent some time talking about why this is a reasonable thing to optimize. And uh, I mentioned that this particular function is convex. So all we need is to give it to some convex optimizer and we are done. The specific optimizer that we are looking at is uh, gradient descent, and in particular, stochastic gradient descent. And the idea of stochastic gradient descent is that uh, we want to, uh, well, it's an algorithm that looks something like this. Um, we have a train descent. You initialize your weight vector to be the zero vector. Um, the reason the initialization does not matter is because if we have a convex function and no matter where you initialize, you'll get down to the bottom of the, uh, the function. And learning proceeds in epochs for every, in, in every, at every step, you pick one example randomly, pretend that this is your entire data set and you write down the loss, mean, meaning you write down this function where the summation contains only one element. Let me get rid of that. Where the summation consists only of one element. And now you have a function where there's no summation really. So you can take the gradient of that, take the gradient, you get, you, you compute the gradient, and then you update the weights uh, uh, to W, so that at the teeth step, you update the weight, WT is WT minus one, plus some step size times the gradient. You keep doing this forever, basically, and uh, eventually you'll find that your weight vector converges to the minimum of this function. And all of this was great, 
except how do you compute the gradient of this uh, the hinge loss? Now, in particular, the problem is split. We, we will come to the problem. Uh, are there any questions about anything that we've seen so far? This is a standard recipe for lunch. You write down an optimization problem, which is called the loss function, and then you use an off-the-shelf optimizer. In this case, stochastic gradient descent. There are others. You use off the an off-the-shelf optimizer to find the minimum of the loss function. And the point that minimum the, the parameters that minimize the loss are the best according to this definition of loss. Ask me questions. If not, we're going to move on. So this is a well-established recipe. The only tricky bit here is how do you compute the gradient of this change loss? How do you take the derivative of the SVM objectives, which is a function that looks like this, but with the summation having only one element? How do you compute the derivative of that function? The problem, which uh, I think someone mentioned last in the last lecture, is the change loss is not a differentiable function. If you plot it as a function of y w transpose x and the hinge, it looks like this. So it's a it's basically two lines. But at the point where the two lines meet, of course, there is no uh, great, you can't take the derivative of that function. The hinge loss is not a differentiable function. So how do you take the derivative of this to actually um, uh, be able to take a gradient step? If we can solve this problem, or at least uh, solve this in a satisfactory enough way, then we, nothing stops us from just using a stochastic gradient descent. Any questions about this situation here? If this function was differentiable, you should be able to use standard calculus to take the derivatives, right? So uh, uh, some people have, um, oh, this min should not exist. Some people have some problem with taking the derivative of W transpose W. It's the, the gradient of W transpose W with respect to W is simply 2W. And the reason for that, just like the way to think about that is W transpose W is nothing but a square. It's just W square. And so uh, the, the derivative of a square is just two times that thing. Um, there is a question since we are uh, since we are picking examples one at a time uh, randomly does the order matter and this uh, how do you maintain that the experiment that you run is reproducible when someone else runs it that's a very very good question um, there are two answers to that question the first answer is if you have a convex function the theory tells us that uh, if you run it or i run it we will end up at almost the same answer to the point where it's not going to matter too much but it's not identical it's just almost the same the only way we know to make sure that our your run and my run is reproducible is if you set all the random seeds. So you need to set the random seed at the beginning of when you read your code. Just when, when you read your data, even at the often in a lot of ML code, the first step tends to be in Python, for example, you have all your imports and then you set all your random seeds. And I say all your random seeds, not a random seed, because uh, it turns out there are multiple random seeds in our libraries. So that Python has one, NumPy has one, I think Torch has at least one. Um, so invariably there's a helper function that says set all random seeds that sets them all to some number. Um, if you're using NumPy and Python in your code, you need to set two random seeds, for example. Um, and if you set the random seed, then it's reproducible, um, except for some very, very weird edge cases where even if you set the random seed, things are not reproducible. That's because the implementation of the random number generator has changed. That you might say that's very weird, but it has actually happened in recent memory where um, 
NVIDIA's internal uh, code changed how they produce random numbers. And so different versions of the code produce different results. But reproducibility becomes problematic, especially when we have objective functions that are not convex. And that is actually a huge problem uh, to the point where sometimes it, you, know, you might see a result in a research paper that may look uh, promising. And then when you re-implement it, things don't work because not only is there this reproducibility issue because of randomness, but there are so many extra design decisions in code that actually make a difference. So in general, ML reproducibility is a huge um, um, sort of a concern. And it's worth thinking about reproducibility when you're implementing your code because uh, you want to make sure that at the very least, uh, someone else who runs your code sees the exact same thing. Okay, so we have this problem with hinge loss. Um, hinge loss is not differentiable. And the answer to this is, uh, it turns out we can't use the standard definition of derivatives for solving this problem. We need to look at something called a subgradient or a subderivative. A subgradient is a generalization of a gradient to functions that are not differentiable, uh, but are continuous and have only a finite number of points where they are not differentiable. The, there's a lot of math around this, and I'm going to try to simplify things here. Uh, the one way to think about it is what is a gradient? A gradient to the function, it corresponds to uh, an approximation of this function with a line. So at this point, what is the best line that approximates that function? So for a convex function, a tangent is a hyperplane. That line is a tangent line. In general, uh, it's a, you get a tangent plane. You can generalize that to something called a subtangent. A sub a subtangent is uh, at a point. Let's say we are currently at this point here. A subtangent at a point is any hyperplane that lies below the function at that point and touches the function there. So in the immediate neighborhood, it's below the function, and in the at that point, it touches the function. That's a subtangent. And a subgradient, just like a gradient is the slope of a tangent, a subgradient is the slope of the subtangent. Now, if your function is differentiable, it has a unique tangent. So every so the subtangent is nothing but the tangent. When your function is not differentiable, then we get uh, into something more interesting. So here's an example. Uh, this is a picture from a fantastic uh, lecture by uh, Ibn Boyd, whose work on convex optimization is in some sense the canonical, uh, his, his textbook on convex optimization is uh, the canonical one. So formally, a sub, uh, uh, any vector g is a subtangent to this function at a given point x if for any y, f of y, the value of the uh, function f of y is above the, the, the linear approximation. So this is a linear approximation. It is simply f of x plus g transpose y minus x. It's a line or a hyperplane. So the subtangent is, uh, um, uh, uh, g is a subgradient if for any point, the line be uh, lies below the function. So consider two points here. Say we have this function f1, f of x. Notice that f of x is, in, according to this picture, it continues everywhere except at this one point where, uh, just take my word for it, that it's not, uh, it's, sorry, it's differentiable everywhere except at that one point. So let's say we have two different points, x1 and x2. The function f is differentiable at x1. The tangent at that point is f of x1 plus g transpose x minus x1 or G1. So G1 is the gradient of that function. This is nothing but your standard definition of the gradient. You take the derivative of any function, uh, you'll get the gradient. The more interesting case is at X2. At X2, there are multiple lines that lie below the function, that touch the point uh, and lie below the function. So let's zoom in there a bit. So this line here, satisfies the property 
that it fastens the function at x2 and lies below. This line also satisfies the property. And in fact, any line in between them also satisfies that property. There's an infinite number of lines that span this thing that satisfy the property that they touch the function at that point and lie below the function everywhere. All of these together are called subtangents. So subgradients are not really one thing, but really a set. In fact, it's an infinite set. In this example, both G1 and G2. Any questions about this? This is a generalization of a gradient to the fun to functions that are uh, continuous everywhere and are differentiable are not differentiable at a finite number of points. Well, the finite number is not inherent in the definition, but it matters for the algorithm. Yes. Why is we having to involve the function? Is there any problem for convex? Um, for now, it's only for convex. Eventually, what we'll do is it's below the function in a small neighborhood around. That's what we'll uh, uh, for not non-convex functions. We'll just look at a tiny neighborhood around and say it should be below that function, and that neighborhood can be really epsilon size. Yes. And everything in between also satisfies that property. Because the property is that uh, the value of the function should be more than, should be above the line. So look at the line in between here that I've drawn, this line here. The value of the function, which is this part and this part, is lying above. So any... Uh, if G2 and G3, let's say G2 is from the left and G3 is from the right, uh, any value of G that is like an average of those two uh, 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 will also be a subgradient. Because that line corresponds, that satisfies the, the definition that the function lies about. Does that uh, okay. okay, so we have subgradients. Uh, so now we can talk about this. Uh, um, well, let's first compute the subgradient of uh, the SVM object. And the only tricky bit here is because of this max. And let me tell you the, the uh, like a neat recipe for computing the subgradient of the max function. So let's say you have max of uh, G1 of X comma G2 of X. Let's say this is F of X. The general strategy is for the subgradient at any point, first you find out is the function g1 or g2 contribute, uh, you know, um, defining the function at that point. So, so what you do is if, uh, let's say I, I want to calculate the, uh, the subgradient at x, is if g1 of x is greater than G2 of X, then it is applied at X. So this says if the value of the function G1 is bigger than the value of function G2 at a given point, then compute the gradient of G1. If the value of function the function G2 is bigger than the function G1 at the given point. Then the subgradient is simply uh, G2. It's easier to interpret this uh, using this feature here. So let's zoom in on that one point that is problematic. I can ask what is the gradient of this function at any point. Let's say we are interested in this point here. Um, this is G1. Oh, I, I've used G here. So let's, uh, let's say this function is F1 and this is F2. F1 might be continuing like this, and F2 might be continuing like this. So at a point X here, I can ask, is F2, the, the function is defined by F2. So the, the subgradient of that function at this point is simply the derivative of F2. At this point here, the function is defined by F1, because the function is defined to be max of 
F1 comma F2. So the gradient and the subgradient is simply the derivative of F1. At this point, F1 and F2 are both equal. Pick one, it doesn't really matter because both of them are subplanes. So you pick either F1 of X or F2 of X, take its derivative, and that's defined to be the subplane. And this recipe applies nicely to the case of the hinge loss, where we have this uh, max of, of 0, comma 1 minus yi w transpose xi. I can ask, what's the derivative of this with respect to w? w is the weight vector. That's the only thing we care about, the subderivative of this. And the way to answer that is first ask, given the current w is 0 bigger than 1 minus y w transpose x, in that case, the subderivative, so if 0 is bigger than then the subgradient is entirely defined by zero. So the, the whatever that is divided by is simply zero. I'm putting a box to indicate this thing here. Else, there's a subgradient is the derivative of one minus y w transpose x with respect to w, which is simply minus y i x i. So the sub, sub gradient is defined in the following way. At a given point, W, you are if 1 minus Y W transpose X is less than 0. Did I? Yeah, if it's less than 0, in which case the sub gradient is 0. If 1 minus Y W transpose X is more than 0, then the uh, sub gradient is Y I X I. This is like, a, I'm, I'm telling you this as a recipe. So the, the recipe is First, solve the max, meaning figure out given the current uh, input w, are you in uh, are you on this side or on this side, and whichever one contributes to the function, you calculate it. Great. Yes. So I know that you mentioned that it's kind of like a subgradient. It didn't matter which of them take which they were both. Yes, that's right. Is that still true in this SVM? It is absolutely true. Okay. It, because this, this is just a special case of that. Okay. Yeah, so this is true. So I can just writing this more cleanly. The derivative of the loss function at a point W is if the max is equal to zero, in which case zero is bigger than one minus y w transpose x, this whole function just simply becomes half w transpose w. And the derivative of half of beta for w with respect to w is simply w. If the whole function is not equal to zero, which means it is greater than zero, then the derivative is exactly the derivative of half w transpose w, which is w, my plus c times the derivative of this quantity here, which is minus y i x i. So you get w minus c times y i x i. If you've not seen subgradients before, this might seem weird, um, but it works. Yes. Um, not to try to make this a little complicated, but is there any benefit for each of those finite number of non critical points? Since the person on the left side, you get a certain gradient, on the right side, you get a certain gradient. Technically, it doesn't matter which one it is, they both start gradient less. Is there any benefit to trying to give an average of the two? No, doesn't, it, it really does not matter. It, it does not change anything for the theory. Yeah. How do you get the value for C? Uh, the answer is we use cross validation. So C is part of, it's not part of the learning process, it's something that controls the whole uh, learning algorithm. We can now put all of this together to write down stochastic subgradient descent for the for the SVM objective. I'm going to just present the algorithm and then we'll uh, go over this, uh, go over the pieces. So just what we need to remember is that the gradient of uh, the loss function at that example is that thing there that I, that I was going to the top. 
I can, before we go do anything, oh well, we'll let's just do this. So we initialize the training set, uh, sorry, we initialize your weight vector, w to zero vector, in this case, the function is convex. So the initialization doesn't really matter, but uh, for simplicity, let's say it is zero. Our, our examples are all labeled with minus one and one. Uh, eventually we'll be returning this weight vector after it gets updated. Learning proceeds in multiple epochs at each step. Uh, you pick a random example. Remember I told you the version of subgradient descent that I, uh, sorry, stochastic gradient descent that I mentioned before was at each step, you pick one random example, pretend it's your entire data set, and then um, uh, uh, make the update, and then put that example back in the bucket, and then you pick a random example again and do that. But that, it turns out, has a technical problem. I'll not tell you what the answer is, but I'll tell you what the problem is, um, or, or why that happens, I'll tell you what the problem is. Um, it turns out if you iterate for uh, T steps, at each point you pick an example, you make an update, you put it back in, you pick an example, you put it back in. There is a non-zero probability that some set of examples will never get picked. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to prove. So this version of stochastic gradient descent is not the one that's typically implemented. The one that's typically implemented looks a lot like your batch perceptron. What you do is you have an, an inner loop. In the inner loop, you iterate over the entire training set once again. Typically, before doing that, the training set is shuffled. That's where the randomness comes in. And then now you're sitting on one example, xi, yi, inside the inner loop. You pretend that that example is your entire data set, compute the subgradient, and then take a gradient step using this definition of the uh, subgradient. Let's unroll this gradient step a little bit because it actually has a neat, uh, a neat interpretation. So the gradient is simply either W or W minus C, Y, I, X, I. But rather than writing it like this, let's uh, just erase that and write it in a slightly different way. If the max of 0, 0,1 minus y i w transpose x i. Let me move this here. If it is greater than 0, if it's greater than 0, then we are on this side here. Right? So if it's greater than 0, then the update w is w minus gamma t, and we need to use the gradient w minus t. Y, I, X, I. Else, we are on the top branch of that conditional definition. W is W minus gamma T times W. Right, I just plugged in that definition there. Now, um, at the risk of making the slides very ugly, I'm going to just scribble around this. Let's take this quantity here and simplify this. This is simply saying W is, um, you have W minus gamma times W, so it is W times one minus gamma T. And then this minus and this minus become a plus, so it is plus gamma T C by I X I. So, is that fine? I've just reorganized the thing in the red box. And similarly, this thing here can be written as W is W times one minus gamma T. So if max of uh, zero comma one minus Y W transpose X is greater than zero, then you update the W by multiplying it by one minus gamma t, and then adding gamma c times y i x i. Otherwise, if it is equal to zero, if max of zero comma blah, blah, blah is equal to zero, then you just multiply the existing weight by one minus gamma t. Let me now rewrite this part here. 
if max of 0, 1 minus y i w transpose x i is greater than 0, that is exactly the same as y i w transpose x i is less than 1. If y i w transpose x i is less than 1, then 1 minus that is going to be greater than 0. And that's the thing that gets it. Never. Question. Questions about any of these things that I've done so far. And if you feel like my handwriting is terrible, uh, I have a cleaned up version on the next slide. But uh, uh, any questions? Yes. So if you get the, the bottom sort of the time, does that approach zero? It does. Yeah. Right. Isn't that weird? Keep that thought. Let's come back to that. That's a very good observation. Okay. The observation was in this if else side of things, if you keep hitting the else all the time, then you are applying this rule. Gamma t is a number between 0 and 1. So 1 minus gamma t is the number between 0 and 1. Multiplying w by a number between 0 and 1 makes it smaller. Mm -hmm. If you keep hitting the else side all the time, you're basically taking w to 0. There's a neat interpretation for that. So let me show you the cleaned up version of this. Um, I just had a, there's only one change here that from what I had before, I have a less than equal to, which is always a safer thing to do for the same reasons why I recommended less than equal to in perceptron. So for every training example, if y w transpose x is less than or equal to 1, then you multiply the weight by 1 minus the learning rate. And then you add the current example yi, but scale, sorry, x, you add the current example xi. So for a positive example, you add it directly. For a negative example, you add minus xi. But the step size is gamma times the hyperparameter c. If 1 minus, if y w transpose x is greater than 1, then you just multiply the existing weight by 1 minus gamma t. Gamma is the learning rate. And there are many, many tweaks that are possible. We'll uh, look at a few uh, examples of how you might pick a good gamma. Um, one other practical thing is before entering this loop here, it's important to shuffle the examples at the start of each epoch. And that uh, makes a difference. Some of you tried this with your, uh, I think, homework too, where with your perceptron, you did not shuffle your examples and you found that it does not it underperform. Uh, the randomness actually helps. Um, any questions about the algorithm itself? And then uh, after, after that, I'm going to talk about a learning rate in practice. So any questions about the mechanics of it? You should be able to implement this. In fact, you might be implementing this for the next homework along with the logistic regression. Yes. Why the, why the random match? Because the, the theory of stochastic gradient descent, which is the original algorithm that we saw, not the one where you're going through multiple epochs, requires there to be no bias in the uh, in the way the examples are selected. And that that, that condition is necessary for you to get to the optimal. You should be able to implement. So ask me, but think about how you might implement this. Uh, and also think about how different this is from your perceptron implementation. The reason this converges is because stochastic gradient descent comes with a guarantee of convergence in expectation. That means if you run this for infinity box with high probability, you'll, be, you'll get closer and closer to the optimum. Uh, but that's only true if your learning rate satisfies certain properties. Um, a way to kind of describe the properties is that the step size for the learning rate should be square summable, but not summable. What that means is you have these gamma t's, right? First of all, they should always be positive. That's important. The second thing is if you add up gamma t, 
all the way to infinity, this should diverge. This should actually uh, tend to infinity. But if you add up the squares of the gamma t, this should be strictly less than infinity. So it, sh it should not be summable, meaning adding them up um, uh, takes you, the, uh, adding them up takes you to infinity. But if you take the squares and add them up, you get a number that is uh, less than infinity. And there are many, many different learning rate schedules that schedules that satisfy this property. The simplest one, I think, is something that looks like this. This is what you use for your uh, perceptron on homework. Gamma t at the tp path is gamma naught, some constant, divided by 1 plus c. Adding all of them up, I'm not going to prove that uh, the sum of them diverges, but uh, it's kind of a fun thing to think about. Here's another example that also works. It takes your c, the hyperparameter, into account in deciding how big the step should be. Um, if you if in doubt, use the simplest thing. But in fact, in practice, there's a whole cottage industry around picking the right learning rate because choosing the learning rate carefully in a data-driven fashion can lead to faster convergence. Um, speaking of convergence, we can ask, how quickly does this get to the optimum? But that's an unreasonable question because we know that it gets to the optimum at, in expectation, eventually at infinity. So rather than asking when it gets exactly to the optimum, we can ask how quickly does it get to within some small epsilon of the best. And by some small epsilon, I mean in terms of the loss value, how quickly does the function. So if you have the loss function that looks like this, rather than getting to the exact minimum, I can be happy if it's below some, if it's within some epsilon. So anything under that line is good. So for a certain definition uh, of strongly convex functions, we don't need to worry about that now. Um, if you have a data set with n examples that are d-dimensional, the simple gradient descent takes order of n d times log 1 over epsilon. Whereas stochastic gradient descent takes d over epsilon steps. Now, the, the crazy thing about that is notice that the size of the data set is missing. So you can get to within epsilon, and this, the time it takes to getting within epsilon does not depend on how many examples you have. It just requires these many time steps. Um, so that's one of the reasons why stochastic gradient descent is always better if the, your data set is much bigger. Uh, this is a, uh, a an interesting proof. If you're interested, I can point you to a paper that has this. There are many, many, many variants of SGD. In fact, uh, vanilla SGD is not what's typically used in uh, the state-of-the-art machine learning today. Um, there are many variants. Uh, there's something called Adagrad, which came about from around 2012. There's this idea of yeah. momentum, which I don't know if there's a real citation, but uh, people cite uh, some lecture notes by Jeff Hinton for that. Uh, no, actually, they use that to recite the RMS prop that uh, lecture notes. There's something called an accelerated gradient, Adam. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them. Today, the best, uh, the, the, the most popularly used uh, variant of SGD that seems to be somewhat more stable is Adam, or actually a mild variant of, uh, some mild variant of Adam, but uh, in PyTorch, the default, not the default, but the most common choice is uh, to use Adam uh, optimizer. These are all the names of different optimizers. And this is the cool thing about disentangling the problem of defining what it means to learn, namely defining the loss function, from how the learning is done. In other words, defining the optimization algorithm. So there are a group of people who can be optimizing the optimizer, and there are a group of people who can be working on the loss function itself, and you know improvements kind of stack on top of each other. Any questions? Yes. So what is this given to get into this big enough number of iterations with the accuracy of the Not accuracy, loss. Loss. Okay. That's the loss for the data set with the box. Right? Yes, and that's right. That's the loss for the this has nothing to generalization. This is how good are you at optimizing this particular object? Because the, the generalization comes from um the notion that this objective is good enough. 
is a good approximation. You know, for SVM, we have this uh, idea that uh, it maximizes the margin at some things. Let's uh, spend a little bit of time staring at this algorithm again. And I want to come back to this uh, to these two sides of uh, um, this if else. Let's you know, number these statements. So let's call this um, A and this is B. So to get to A, for this particular example, you need to have Y W transpose X is less than or equal to one. Remember, when Y W transpose X is less than zero, that means that this example is a mistake. That we saw that with perceptron. Here it says when y w transpose x is less than one, then you go to step a. Less than one is essentially saying this example is within the margin. If this essentially just has perceptron decides that uh, if the example is on the wrong side of the hyperplane, then you need to make an update using the example in SVM in the, with SGD. If this example is within the margin, and this must be very similar to the margin perceptron that uh, we've seen before. Here, if this example is within the margin, then you make an update that essentially looks, that says, you take your original wage, W, forget all the scaling factors. You take your original wage and you add YI XI. Does this seem familiar? If, they, if there's a mistake, you add YI XI to the wage vector. It's, it's basically like perceptron. Mm -hmm. Now let's consider case B, and that's the question that you had. If this example was not a mistake, if this example was, in fact, not just not a mistake, if this example was not on the wrong side of the margin, that means everything is good with this example. So what you do is you multiply your weights with some number between zero and one. This is called shrinking. Shrinking the weight vector maximizes the margin, right? Minimizing the norm of W, this multiplying W by a number between zero and one makes the weight vector, the norm of the weight vector go down, which means it increases the margin. So basically what this algorithm says is if this example does it, it is, a, is a case of a mistake, or if this example is within the margin, then correct the weight vector by adding the example. If it turns out this example is correct. Uh, correctly classified and on the correct side of the margin, then let's try to big, make the margin bigger so that we get some better generalization. Remember, the objective for SVM has half W transpose W plus C times loss, the hinge loss. Step A tries, is, uh, both, both these terms contribute to step A, but step B is influenced only by this thing. So, Taking, take, taking your existing weight and making uh, the uh, updated step B reduces the value of W transpose W, and as a result, it improves generalization. So SVM balances these two things, or at least this algorithm for SVM balances these two things. Any questions about this? And this hopefully addresses the question that you had. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Sure. Oh yeah. So uh, in the let's see if I can do this. Let's go here. So say you have this weight vector, and let's say you have this this margin, uh, and let's say you are, you have an example that's somewhere here. Effectively, what the shrinking step does is it tries to push this out. It tries to make the margin bigger. So it will try to move it out by, it tries to widen this margin. That's the, that's the effect it eventually has. The reason for that is if you think about how we derive that regularizer, that the way we derive the regularizer, we want to maximize the margin, which it turns out was equal to one over the norm of W. This maximizing this was equivalent to maximizing the margin, and that's exactly the same as uh, minimizing the norm of W. 
I mean, I don't want to redo the whole derivation, but effectively it has this uh, effect that it moves this thing farther and farther by, by shrinking. In the limit, if you have no data point, then let's say you had, you didn't have even this, then what you would end up doing is you would end up moving this all the way to infinity and that corresponds to the zero weight vector. The zero weight vector is simply one, over, the, the norm of the zero weight vector is zero. If you are shrinking the weight vector w to some one minus gamma times w, you keep doing this again and again, this will eventually get to zero. That corresponds to the margin being infinitely wide. So every shrinking step basically moves the, makes the band wider and wider. So the decision plane, even the decision plane does not change. Yes, that's right. The decision plane does not change. Remember when we were talking about uh, when I when I introduced SVM, I said the magnitude of W transpose X does not matter. It's only the sign that matters. The mag the magnitude by shrinking, the magnitude is basically made smaller. That does not change the decision, but it changes the margin. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about in this context is to compare. SVM with its stochastic gradient descent to the positron algorithm. So we've seen this before. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, but I want to kind of make it very clear. These two algorithms are so similar to each other, except for these boxes here. This is the, the thing that I just do the box around with SVM. This is the perceptron. In both cases, you compute y w transpose x. In SVM, you check if it's less than one. In perceptron, you check if it's less than zero. If it's less than one, you you shrink the weight for SVM and then add a uh, um, add the example with the appropriate um, scaling with the appropriate step size. Whereas in perceptron, the weights are not shrunk, and you just add the example. SVM has this whole else case that doesn't exist for perceptron. And what the else part does is it improves generalization. Perceptron can overfit. SVM can also overfit. Doesn't not saying it can't, but SVM has a built-in mechanism for improving generalization by maximizing this one. The way to introduce generalization, to improve generalization of perceptron, is not to change this part, but to do something that you already did in your homework. They use average perceptron. You inject generalization into perceptron by average. SVM comes with it baked in. Yes. So, are there any ways to optimize like, what? I know we talked about optimize what? With perceptron, we did the very 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 Bounds for oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. That, that was the margin for right? Yeah. So we don't need that anymore because here we have that one. You know, there's no reason to optimize that. So there's, there's no value better than one. Well, there's no reason to because this part will take care of it. Okay. So if you're kind of scaling the weight up and down automatically. So you don't need that. So in fact, the fact that SVM and perceptron are so close to each other is not really a coincidence. There's a completely different way to introduce the perceptron algorithm. I presented a historical introduction by talking about um, the online version. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to kind of get you familiar with online learning. I could have introduced perceptron entirely differently and said, it turns out perceptron, the algorithm, the back perceptron algorithm, is nothing but stochastic subgradient descent for the perceptron loss. The perceptron loss is this quantity here. It is given an example x, y, and the weight vector w. The perceptron loss is max of 0, minus y, w transpose x. It doesn't have any regularized. SVM optimizes the regularized hinge loss. The hinge loss is max of 0, 1 minus y, w transpose x. Literally just one difference here. There's the one here, which is acting as a margin, and that's absent. There's another difference. There's no regularization in perceptron. SVM has regularization. If you, I, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. Derive the subgradient of the perceptron loss 
and plug it into the stochastic subgradient descent that recipe, and you should invent the perceptron orbit. This is not a, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that these two things are so close to each other. Did you have a question? So let me wrap up the FPM section. Um, or at least from the optimization point of view. Uh, we are minimizing the regularized change loss, and we're going to solve it. We, we, we looked at how we can solve it using stochastic gradient descent. It's a bit of a mouthful to keep saying stochastic subgradient descent, so I'm just going to say SGD. Uh, and the gradient here, if the, uh, because change loss is not differentiable, is assumed to be the subgradient. Um, it's worth kind of thinking a little more about the comparison of the perceptron algorithm, the perceptron does not maximize the uh, the margin. Um, there are variants of perceptron in the margin perceptron. We do have a margin, but the way to kind of bring in better generalization with perceptron is with average. Um, getting the number of steps right can be a little tricky. Um, if you take if you if your uh, step size the initial step size is really large, you might end up overshooting, and then you spend a lot of time kind of correcting. If your initial step size is too small, you might take really tiny steps and you'll take forever to get to the bottom. So optimizing the uh, the learning rate, how do you do it? How, 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 and when I say learning rate, I mean it's gamma t is gamma naught divided by one plus t. Uh, this gamma naught here. Optimizing that thing, how do you find a good value for the step size? Cross-validation. Now we have two hyperparameters, the t and the step size. And you need to kind of start doing cross-validation over more and more things or get comfortable with that because uh, we are only getting started with making this process complicated. Um, I want to end with the note that this stochastic gradient descent is just one of many optimizers that can exist for uh, the SCM, in, for any of these optimi uh, objectives. Uh, in particular, for uh, support vector machines, another optimization strategy called coordinate descent in the dual is widely used. Uh, dual coordinate descent is actually the basis of uh, uh, a popular machine learning library called LibLinear. If, if you've used scikit-learn, or if you've heard of scikit-learn, it has an implementation of SVM, which actually calls LibLinear. So it's internally using dual coordinate descent. Dual coordinate descent is a very, very fun thing to derive. And by fun, I mean like you make, if you're deriving it, make sure you have like two or three whiteboard worth of space. Uh, uh, that kind of fun. Any questions? Yes. I would suggest as a practical thing, not. Pick a small number of epochs and just a small number. Yeah, you're right. I mean, <laughs> there is no right answer. Um, unfortunately, it it uh, uh, running cross validation over multiple hyperparameters becomes more and more problematic. So often, what is done is we don't do cross validation at all. We just do validation, where we have one held out set and we evaluate against that. I'll talk about validation and cross validation in the next lectures. Other questions? Questions about SVM? We are going to switch topics after this. So, questions about the SVM objective, the idea that maximizing the margin is a good thing, or stochastic gradient descent. We won't be looking at stochastic gradient descent in this much detail uh, after this. Uh, when we talk about logistic regression, what I'll do is I'll say, um, this is what we need to do for logistic regression. Here's the objective function. And we can use stochastic gradient descent. And I'll not talk about how. So you need to, what you need to be able to do is given a loss function, you need to be able to take derivatives of that loss function. Um, in fact, if you don't want to take derivatives of the loss function and you want to make it itself a, 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 a computational process, then you can wait till we come to neural networks because back propagation will do that for you. But I don't think it's worth uh, getting, jumping ahead. It's worth doing these things on paper by hand. Otherwise, you'll not really understand what's going on. So a strong, strong suggestion to go back, take the derivative of the um, change loss, the subgradient. Make sure that 
you can reconstruct everything I told you uh, using the same, following the same steps. Because you'll be doing that uh, for logistic regression eventually for in, in your homework. 